This is World of Business, your weekly cutting-edge business premium show where we look into the trending business issues and latest developments on the stock markets. We also herald the unsung but thriving business entrepreneurs on this program. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of World of Business. I am Alvin Matawa. Now, government has exempted a value-added tax on a number of goods and services in a move that is likely to result in price reductions, or so we think. Now, we are going to look at this in detail in the second segment with economists Simon Gwenzi and Tatenda Nyachega. But first, we take a look at the exchange rates as of today. Exchange rates as of Wednesday were the Zimbabwe dollar to the United States interbank rate was at 12,093 cents. The Zimbabwe dollar to the Great Britain pound interbank rate was at 15,241 cents. The Zimbabwe dollar to the euro interbank rate was at 12,957 cents. The Zimbabwe dollar to the South African rand interbank rate was at 0.0016. The Zimbabwe dollar to the Botswana polar interbank rate was at 8 hundred and eighty six dollars and sixty six cents we also give you the commodity prices on the global market Commodity prices on the global market as of Wednesday afternoon were gold per ounce traded at 2,003 cents after it went down by 0.20 percentage points. Silver per ounce traded at $22.01 after it went down by 0.65 percentage points. Copper per pound traded at $369.75 after it went down by 0.36 percentage points. Platinum per ounce traded at $876.48 after it went up by 0.14 percentage points. Well, that's all we had for this first segment of World of Business. Do join us in the second segment of our show as we get straight in the discussion. Welcome back to the second segment of World of Business. Now, as said earlier on, today we are looking at the resolution of government according to the statutory instrument 15 of 2024, where certain goods and services and imports have been exempted from paying value-added tax. That's your VAT. Now, this follows an announcement that was made recently uh, by Treasury concerning a value-added tax. Now in studio, I'm joined by Mr. Simon Gwenzi. He is a tax advisor and also Mr. Tatenda Nyachega, who is an economist. Gentlemen, welcome to World of Business. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, very to begin the conversation, certain goods and uh, services, some which include uh, water for domestic use, uh, domestic electricity, uh, have been exempted from value-added tax. Can you further explain the economic significance of this move at a time when uh, pricing on commodities seems to have gone very high? I'll start with you, Mr. Gwens. Thank you very much. Uh, so when we are looking at uh, exemption of products, we need to first understand the categorization of products for VAT. Mm -hmm. So there are three categories under which products can be placed. The first one is uh, zero rating where VAT is charged at the lower rate, which is 0%. And the second one is the higher rate of VAT, which is 15%. And the third category is the exemption. So the focus of our discussion is on exemption. So you, you find when goods are exempted from VAT, what it basically means is that uh, the supplier of those goods will not be able to recover the VAT that they incur on their costs. They will become the final consumer of goods and services that are incurred in the production of those goods. However, when then they supply the exempt product, they will not be a, a charging VAT. So the big question is, does the exemption reduce or increase prices? 
I think mm -hmm. that's the debate that we can then uh, proceed and uh, discuss. Mm -hmm. So now we are saying that uh, they have uh, uh, reduction on VAT on uh, the goods they are uh, selling, but uh, the expenses now that they are incurring also have still have the VAT. That that's correct. Okay. So so that is the big question there to say the f the end product has been exempted from VAT, but the inputs. Mm -hmm that uh, the supply of those exempt products have not been exempted necessarily. Some of them are still charged VAT at a higher rate of 15%. And uh, the supplies of those goods become final consumers of those inputs. Okay, so now we should not expect a reduction in prices? There, there's no yes or no answer to that. It basically depends with the business model of um, a, a, a supplier of those products. Uh, prices may, may, may go up. Prices may may be the same, depending on the input matrix uh -huh. uh, of, of the supply of those products. Uh -huh. ah, thank you very much. Now, uh, Tatenda, let's talk about uh, the exemption on big uh, income earners, such as uh, fuel and tobacco. Are we not looking at a situation where the GDP is negatively implicated on uh, these issues? So looking on or maybe defining it from uh, what Mr. Gwenzi just highlighted in terms of uh, the approach to the exemption, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it becomes a two-folded or a two-sided coin where you would like to look on the other side where we are saying if this exemption is going to be begged, because we, already when you are talking of VAT, that, that's, that's, that's a source of revenue for, for, for the government. And we, when I was looking on the statistics, uh, it's around, it contributes, when you look on taxation as a percentage of GDP, that's around almost 18% mm -hmm. when I was looking at it. Mm -hmm. So having that exemption and that exemption being uh, put on the government, then it means in terms of the resources that the government is supposed to have uh, for various um, uh, obligations as a nation or, or expenditures that, that, that they are supposed to meet, then it will definitely have a negative implication, which will overall uh, have a negative impact on the overall GDP or performance of the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so questions have also been asked on uh, reducing uh, the, or removing rather, the VAT on uh, such important commodities as uh, water and electricity, because uh, these now have, uh, we talk of your duty and uh, the VAT exemption, they work hand in hand. How does this work now, Mr. Simon? Now, when we look at um, the, the connection of uh, duties and VAT, uh, for importation purposes, uh, VAT is a form of duty. Mm -hmm. So normally, um, products that are non-jutable on importation are also non vatable uh -huh. But for local supplies, there are certain products that may be dutable uh, on importation, but may be then exempt when they are then supplied locally. And the reason is duties are normally uh, provided or used by the government for purposes of control, uh, control of importations or encouraging importations, as it were. Uh -huh. But the VAT now, the objective of a VAT is for revenue enhancement measures. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between duties and VAT. So duties may be imposed in order to, to manage the importations of goods. But then VAT is normally imposed as a revenue enhancement measure for government. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's talk about this because this seems to be a very critical issue. Since uh, the 2024 budget proposal, by the Minister of Finance, uh, Professor Mtulim Nobe, there has been changes in policy regarding taxation, inconsistencies. Now, does this mean uh, that uh, uh, government it does not know what is doing in terms of uh, this VAT or taxation issues, anything which is associated? All right. Uh, so w when, when you talk of policy inconsist inconsistencies, I think this has been a thing uh, for more than a decade now uh, being raised. But w when you talk of policies, I, I would say policies are not an event, but they are a process. Mm -hmm. So if it is a process, then we have to make sure that this, this process is smooth from the initial stages to the final stages, which mm -hmm. is by initial stages, we are talking of the consultation period how consultative, how inclusive is the police process 
until the final stage, which is the implementation stage. Uh -huh. But if you have got uh, players or key stakeholders which are only uh, appearing uh, on the process at the final stage, which is the implementation stage, that's where you tend to have flaws and that's where you tend to have questions uh, being risen or be, be being raised. So these inconsistencies in our case, I would uh, refer them to the, pro to the process as a whole, mm -hmm. to say that sometimes I've, I personally feel that it's not inclusive. That's why we end up having all these challenges where we are saying today we have got this statement, then tomorrow we have got this statement, which is reversing that. Mm -hmm. The reason of it being reversed is because there is a key stakeholder who actually r raised a flag to say this is what, is, what should have been done. So uh, yes. in terms of avoiding that, that means our policy processes need to be smooth from the initial stage to the implementation stage. Okay, now, Mr. Gwenzi, this instability has been cited by some ma as a major uh, driver towards business and market failure. What is your take on this, and does government have a set a policy or agenda that industry can use for planning? <coughs> True. So, so you know, one, one of the tenets of um, a good tax system is uh, predictability uh -huh. and uh, also consistency. So businesses, when they plan, sometimes they don't plan for tomorrow. They plan years ahead. And they want an environment where uh, the tax policy environment can be predictable in the long term. Uh -huh. So in situations where you are not able to predict the tax policy environment because it impacts heavily on business, uh, it may be a cost. It can, it can actually be a cost because compliance for taxes can be a cost to business. Uh -huh. So policy consistency is good. Policy inconsistency is not good for business because it will disrupt strategic planning. Yes. So uh, moving on, addressing the first cabinet meeting of the year last week, amidst uh, implementation of a raft of measures of policies uh, to arrest uh, prices uh, and stabilize the foreign exchange rate. Uh, President Emerson Munangagwa said structured currency is set to be introduced. Now, Tatenda, what should we expect and what is this structured currency that uh, the president was talking about? So to begin with, uh, to talk of a structured currency, um, that's, that's a word uh, which is, I would call it an outlier or not often used mm -hmm. in the economic and finance space. Mm -hmm. So my understanding uh, or reading of the word uh, structured, structured currency is when you ride on um, the foreign exchange market or when investors are exposed to the foreign exchange market, but guaranteeing them that you are going to mitigate or manage risks that are associated with that market. Mm -hmm. you, are guaranteeing, you are guaranteeing return on, their, on, on investment, and you are also guaranteeing that the investment objectives are going to be met. Okay. So that, that's, that's, that's my understanding. So when, when, when we hear the term um, structured currency, then mm -hmm. that's what we expect to see, so uh, possibly it's a statement which was is said, but it's a pegged statement, I mm -hmm. would say, mm -hmm. which you expect maybe to be unpegged. But when I was listening to it, it touched on the issues of, okay, we have been an economy which have been dominant on the fiat currency, yes. but we want to lean more, or maybe to have a hybrid of the fiat currency as well as the commodity market, which then goes to the element of the foreign exchange market. Uh, so, so that's what we are so, so, so we're not expecting a new currency, because people on the street were, were, were thinking that uh, maybe uh, new money is coming onto the streets. Yeah, so, so, so my reading of it is it's, it's not a new currency, but mm -hmm. it's just more a, a more lean towards the uh, foreign exchange market where you are guaranteeing the investors that they will get high return on their investment, uh, they, will get, they will meet their investment objectives and you try to mitigate any risks that are associated with the, the investment. Ah, amazing. Now uh, we have talked about uh, the shift in policy over the last two months. Now as we wait for the release of the monetary policy statement, anytime this, uh, this month, what issues should uh, the statement address looking at uh, the fiscal and uh, monetary policies, Mr. Gwenz? I'll, I'll allow my, my friend here, yes. uh, the economist, to so, so <laughs> attempt that. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Gwenz. Uh, so definitely when you talk of a monetary policy statement, what we anticipate are the principles in terms of addressing or uh, addressing the issues to do with the m exchange rate management, inflation management, so that we bring sanity mm -hmm. within the financial sector system as well as the overall economy at large. You had uh, given Tatenda space to speak, but do you have anything <coughs> to add to this? Yes, just to add on to that, from a tax uh, perspective, 
uh, industry and commerce expect the monetary policy to address um, the, the currency and exchange rate issues uh -huh. for the reason that when people plan for their taxes, they want to know how much they are going to be paying tomorrow. And they also want to know in which currency are they going to be paying. Uh -huh. Well, that's it uh, for our segment. of uh, We were talking to uh, Mr. Tatenda Nyachega and uh, Mr. Simon Gwenzi. We were helping us unpack on the issue that we were talking about today, where government, according to the statutory instrument, 15 of 2024, uh, where certain goods and services and imports as well have been exempted from paying value-added tax. We are off to a break. We are back with more after this. Welcome back to the third and final segment of World of Business, where we shed light on our Entrepreneur of the Week. Now, the World of Business team spoke to Mrs. Lizzie Mugabe, a local female entrepreneur who is into heritage-based local food processing, focusing mainly on the baobab fruit. Now, let's hear more from Sela Marere as she speaks to her. Today we have visited a lead entrepreneur in Harare in a mid-40s who is into heritage-based food processing. The baobab fruit is quite familiar for its nutritional values. Talk about incorporating a healthy lifestyle. It is the goal for the citizens of Zimbabwe. She's going to tell us more about her initiatives and this conversation. Her name is Mrs. Lizzie Mugabe. Stay with us. So we are now joined by Mrs. Lizzie Mugabe who is going to tell us more concerning her initiative. Mrs. Mugabe, thank you so much for joining us today and we are looking forward to learn more about this business. Thank you so much, Sela. You're welcome. So, Mrs. Mugabe, first things first, uh, what were the circumstances surrounding you starting this business? We started this project in 2021. Um, you know how it was, we used to take vitamin supplements to boost our immune systems. So it hit my mind that, but we have this fruit, the baobab, which is highly rich in vitamin C, in fact, on researching about it, I realized it's got six times more vitamin C than oranges. So I said to myself, instead of having my children taking pills, which in fact they also have to take after a meal, how about making the food become the medicine? The only challenge that I had back then was how to make them take it, given that it wasn't as palatable as the chewable vitamins that they were used to. So you said what you did was to identify a gap during the COVID-19 era and you decided to exploit it, which was of course a benefit because you saw two, um, two benefits in one product, both as a vitamin C supplement and also as a source of food. What would you say that your product is solving in the history of Zimbabwe? This is a natural resource from our country and uh, it's highly nutritious. It's actually one of the listed fruits which is considered a superfood and we, 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 we are able to get it easily on, from, our local, um, from our local market. We thought of the urban community, they don't have time to make um, these juices. Just like my hair products, you, we all know how to make my hair, but when we are at work, we just want a ready product, so we are providing that for the nation, but uh, making sure that we are making use of this super fruit, which is uh, highly nutritional, dense. So you said um, it's an idea that came as a result of a circumstance, and in this case it was during the COVID-19 era, and you decided to use that as an opportunity to start your business. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you faced when you started and how did you manage to deal with those? Because I'm assuming you were getting into business for the first time. The challenges that I faced when I was starting, it's uh, equipment. When we wanted to... In fact, the first challenge that we, we, we faced was um, shelf life of that product. We, I'm a pharmacist, I'm not a food scientist. I didn't know how to improve the shelf life of uh, a beverage. So we worked closely 
with uh, food scientists that we were referred to by uh, the SME's association who assisted us in coming up with a product that is stable on the shelf and in a way that doesn't uh, affect too much the composition of the nutrients in the fruit. Okay. Then the other challenge that I faced was uh, to do with the processing of the fruit. As a raw ingredient, when we are making the juices, what we want is the powder from the fruit. So it was difficult for us to get machinery which can help us separate the seed from the powder. Because that knowledge is not uh, very widespread, it's, a, it's an industry which hasn't been explored that much. So to cap that problem, we worked closely with our local engineers in coming up with innovative machinery, which uh, we now have. So we cannot run away from the fact that you are adding value to the baobab fruit and also touching on the value addition aspect of the National Development Strategy 1. But how else would you say as an entrepreneur you are adding value to the business and also to the product and also touching on the value addition aspect of the National Development Strategy 1? We work with a group of more than 200 women in the rural areas who are now picking this previously rejected fruit on our behalf and uh, it is also become a source of income for them because we actually pay them to do that for us. When that is done, we, we've taught them the type of fruit that we want and also how to package it for easy transportation when it comes here for further processing. We add value by pulping, separating the seed and putting the powder on its own. By the way, the seed, nothing on the baobab fruit is thrown away. The seed, we take it for oil pressing. It's very good for the skin, it's very good for the skin. So far, we, we, we only have the oil, but there is research and development which is happening so that we end up producing a range of products using the baobab so that we don't sell our baobab is just raw baobab. There is a whole lot of other products which are still under research and development. Then the cake which remains after you press the oil, it's sold as stock feed. So far you've noticed that we don't have that process here. We outsource the process of uh, cold oil pressing. The machines are, are expensive and uh, it's a new thing that we've also started doing. We haven't found the market. We are still researching on our range of products that we are going to make. So I want to draw your attention a bit to the issue of women empowerment. You say that uh, now that you are giving jobs to these women that are in marginalized communities, they've got both a source of income and something to occupy them. What would you say are some of the advantages associated with uh, empowering women in our communities today? Empowering women is a... Is, a, is, is very good. You know that when you empower a woman, you've actually empowered a nation. Uh, gone are the days when women used to just sit in the rural areas, wait for their husbands. We are working in town, waiting for that income. If nothing comes, it means it's poverty for them. Now, they are able to plan using their own finances, using their own work that they would have done, using these projects they are able to plan without necessarily waiting for their, for their husbands, who are most of them based in the cities. Employment creation being one of the uh, elements that you're touching on and also being one of the benefits that have come with you establishing this business, what's your staff complement and what criteria do you use when you're choosing your employees? Since our factory is here in Harare, you know that there's been this advent of uh, increase on youth abusing drugs we decided how about we empower the youth so most of our people who are here in fact all of them they are youth is that we took from from the streets empowered them so that at least if they have something to do earning their own income they are able to be focused with uh, uh, their future and a better life for them instead of resorting to drugs so our staff complement here, so far we've got 10 people who are operating in the factory where we do the juices and the pulping process. We see that we are in an era where GMOs, genetically modified organisms, 
have become widespread and we have got a lot of people especially the youths um enjoying eating this consuming these foods what would you say are some of the benefits that are associated with us getting used to these traditional foods in our diets i come from a family background where there is a high prevalence of cardiovascular diseases and diabetes so those diseases are also hereditary and uh, but you can be able to control them or prevent them using lifestyle a healthy lifestyle and diet plays a major role the baobab fruit according to research it has been shown to be um, we call it a glycemic moderator it doesn't cause spikes in sugar levels when you you are consuming it that's why uh, my family embraced this product well something which is so important to me and uh, would want the whole community to benefit from the same uh, effects of the fruit like how my family has been benefiting from so as a as an sme and also as a as a business entrepreneur in zimbabwe what would you say are some of the export impediments that derail our country's competitiveness when it comes to exporting and what needs to be done in order to improve our competitiveness in exporting? Okay, um, on export competitiveness, um, we've faced challenges um, in regarding the requirements which our targeted countries that we would want to export to the requirements that they need, the types of certifications that they need on our baobab products. They are so expensive and they are not obtained locally. It's been a challenge for us to get enough resources to be able to certify our products according to those export requirements. So what are some of the biggest achievements that you celebrate today, that you look at and say we've done well for ourselves? I'm proud of, of, of the fact that we, we've managed to make a product which is acceptable on all races and cultures. People, Some people would never tasted baobab or never knew about baobab when they test our product. They love it, they embrace it as part of their daily routine. I'm also happy about um, the communities that we are transforming, especially from where the tree is, where the fruit is coming from, where the fruit is coming from, those women, more than 200 families that we have transformed through the project of value addition, the youths that we have taken out of the streets, given them employment here at the factory, and also the recognition that we got through the SME Corporation of Zimbabwe. We were given an award last year on Innovation of the Year Award. Thank you so much, Mrs. Mugabe, for the conversation that we have had today. You have definitely taught us the importance of adopting these traditional foods in our diet because it's something that is normally taken for granted. Such an illuminating conversation we have had with Mrs. Lizzie Mugabe, who has not only taught us the importance of adopting traditional foods in our diet, but has also elucidated on the fact that empowering a woman is indeed empowering the whole community. And that brings an end to this week's segment of our Entrepreneur of the Week. Be sure to join us again on our next segment. It's now back to the studio. Well, that was the third and final segment of World of Business that brought out the importance of local foods in our diet. Well, that's it for this week's edition of World of Business. Pleasant viewing.